We're live. Eric, what's up, man? Thank you so much for joining me on my show. I'm thrilled about this conversation. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right, let's jump right in. Um, I first heard about you not too long ago, maybe two months ago. Uh, Ethan, the former co-host in my podcast, RIP Ethan, uh, he does a ton of research on new creators and he found you and he said, man, check out what this guy's doing. It's so cool. Uh, at that moment, I've reached out to you on Twitter and and since then, I'm sure you've had some momentum since before I found you. Like I'm not that important, right? But but since then, I've I've noticed just a ton of momentum on what you're doing. It seems like you're really hitting, uh, like a you're hitting a, a cool spot, like a cool opening in this this world of the internet. So I want to jump into that. I want to jump into to Reddit. I want to jump into exploding ideas. But before we do, I'm curious, like what have you been doing? beforehand because it's clear that you have some experience you you've done this before right i've just it seems like you're you're recently trying to put yourself out there and you know try to build a personal brand around it so before you dove into this what what was your background like what were you doing um so i guess a lot of different things uh so yeah. when i uh when i was in college um i i was songwriting and i uh landed the music for a couple of big television shows um, and I had an internship at a recording studio, basically in Chicago, and I got to be really good friends with the studio owner, and we ended up splitting 50-50 on a couple of TV shows, basically, where I wrote the music, he had the connections, and we just kind of did that for a summer, and uh, I started getting royalties when I was in college and just reinvesting the money into music. So my initial thing was I want to be a full-time producer. So after I finished that, I went back to school and uh, just reinvested the money and then once I graduated, I was like, okay, I'm going to move to California and uh, just pursue music full time. So I did that. And then I realized how overly political the music industry is. And you really need to know everybody. A lot of these people grew up together and uh, it's a very tough industry. So once the Royal Seas started more or less drying up, I went to go work at Universal Music Publishing Group, which is a music publishing company. They represent uh, songwriters like people like Justin Bieber. And um, I started there as a temp and I was getting paid like nothing. And uh, I worked there for 10 months. Then I got hired full time doing YouTube content monetization. And uh, then I basically hit a point where I was like, I need to make more money. And I was making like $35,000 a year. So it was like nothing. And I was in Los Angeles. So effectively yeah. broke. Um, yeah. And so you're losing money. Yeah. And I was like, the only people that it seems like are really making money here are like the CEO and maybe like one or two other people. Everybody else is kind of just like not really making much. So I was like, what do I need to do to like kind of rise above if that makes sense? So I just started reading a lot of books and I was like, what did these other business people do? Whether it be like Sumner Redstone or like um, Mark Cuban or whoever. I'm just like, if somebody's successful as a book, I'm going to read it more or less. And so I just focused on reading a lot of books and uh, that pushed me into my first idea, which was uh, basically taking our YouTube channel at Universal and doing like songwriter master classes, and then going out and going to companies like Fender and having them like sponsor the videos. And this would be a new revenue stream for the songwriters because that money typically flows to the artists themselves, not the songwriter. So build a small team around that of like same level people at the company, uh, just like low level people. And we pitch it up the ladder basically. And uh, ultimately went to the CEO and she funded the idea. And uh, then at that point, I broke off and went into uh, business affairs full time where I was just doing market research for like two or three years around different like ideas that we could exploit in the market um, that are like gaps, more or less. So I would like kind of ad hoc, just come up with ideas, present them to the executive staff and we would either run with them or we wouldn't. And uh, we had some ideas that we ran with, some were successful, some weren't, but it was like kind of just like a numbers game more or less. And uh, so I did that for a little while. And then I also started uh, doing deal negotiations with um, app companies that wanted to have music in their app. And then during the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, I was like, okay, I need to like really double down and like up my skills because I felt like going down this path of just music, I wasn't really going to make anything. And so uh, I learned to code. So I basically took like a bunch of React courses, JavaScript courses, HTML, CSS, that kind of stuff, Python, and just focused for like three hours every day. Just take these courses. 
Uh, I was single at the time and I was just kind of sitting in my place and I was like, I have nothing else really to do. So I'm just going to learn this stuff. I was always scared to learn it, but I found some good instructors online and I started watching their YouTube videos. Then I paid for their courses and just really like doubled down on focusing on it. And so I basically took that and then I went to a venture capital firm. I was like, I upped my skills and now I could build websites. I could do all this stuff and I have a deep understanding of music and I got really into crypto and I was like, okay, like I'm going to see if I can get a job in like crypto. So uh, basically this venture capital firm, they offered to hire me and we went through like a four month uh, like interview process and then I jumped and I went there. And then after that, I went to one of the portfolio companies and ran, I was head of strategy. So they basically poached me from the, uh, the venture capital firm. And so all in like in parallel, all through these years, I've also had my own businesses online just because I needed more money when I was working in music. I couldn't afford to live just like on that. And I didn't really see like an end in sight. Like I didn't see like the light at the end of the tunnel of like, okay, now I'm going to be okay. Because in Los Angeles, if you Google it, you need to be making like $75,000 a year to be like comfortable. And I was making 35 and I was like, I need to make more money. And they have this whole thing where like, you're only going to get like if you get a raise or you get promoted, you're only going to get like so much of an increase in pay. So you're kind of rent controlled in a way. So I was just yeah. like, I need to diversify. So I just started building online businesses essentially. And um, the Reddit strategy was a, something that came out of that because I didn't really have any money and I needed to be able to test these ideas to see if people would buy my products or whatever it was. And I couldn't spend money on ads. I had to do it organically. So yeah, it all kind of came out of that. Hell of a story. I definitely didn't expect you to be in 80 different places in your journey. So you, you've built up a lot of experience. Um, I need to take a real quick side quest because you said something there that is so important to me. You said, I read a lot of books. I didn't go to college. Um, I'm not a very educated person in the traditional sense, but my parents, I mean, my parents were super young when they had me. And I don't know if that has anything to do with how I grew up or whatever, but they didn't like have a lot of rules in my life. Like I was never, I didn't really grow up in a strict household. Let's just say that. But the one rule that I remember so clearly was just like non-negotiable is I had to read 30 minutes every day. And uh, because of that, I've just been such an avid reader my whole life. Like I'm so grateful for that. And books have had more of an impact on my life than anything. I mean, I'll read anything I can put my hands on. I won't always finish a book if I feel like, you know, this book could have been a blog post. I think that happens a lot recently. Mm -hmm. um, but but older books especially, um, man, uh, like life-changing ideas and concepts that I've learned. So now that I've spent enough time talking about me, what books in particular were the ones that had some of those like, oh shit moments we're like damn i can actually do this this makes sense to me now are there any that come to mind um yes yeah, so yeah. i guess one that i really liked was uh sumner redstone's book i forget what it was called but um he has a book and um it just talks about like his trajectory from like starting out uh he was helping run like a family business and then like he just made a bunch of good decisions basically that ended him up to being where he ended up. I mean, he's dead now, but, um, so there's that book that was really good. Uh, there was also the blitzscaling book, he's which a media he, guy, right? Yeah. Wasn't he like CBS or something? What's he do? Yep. Exactly. He is. Okay, cool. I was nervous to say that because I don't know for sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now. Got it. So CBS. So there's Continue. That, Sorry to cut you off. There's that book. There's the blitzscaling book by Reed Hoffman. I believe it's by and Judge. there's also uh, one book that really stood out was L.A. Reid's book, Sing to Me. I don't know if you've yeah. heard of this book or read this book. Totally. Uh, have you read it? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So one thing that really like stood out to me from that book was L.A. Reid for people that aren't, uh, they may not be aware. Basically, he's a big like record executive and he signed Justin Bieber. And But he had this whole life before signed he was. Signed Pink. Yeah. He signed a ton of people. I believe Usher. Like a bunch of really yeah. like iconic people. And what I didn't realize was he had a whole life before being a record executive. He was like a music producer and he was in a band and he had these other things that he was doing. And he started out, he didn't have, like he was, I believe he was just like not from a great like 
background like he was struggling growing up and um he just like followed his gut and eventually ended up where he ended up but like it was a series of just like good moves and lucky moves that he made over the years and he was like he had produced for michael jackson he had done all these songs that were really big he had signed a bunch of people through his own label and he really like popped off when justin bieber got signed and he that was like i think like 10 or 15 years into his career and he was already extremely successful by that point but he was saying in the book that that was a time that he had never seen like the market pull for something or like a lightning in a bottled moment like he had seen with Justin Bieber. And I think that it parallels really well with like businesses in a way because you don't know what's going to work and resonate with the market. You just don't know until you put it out there and you see it. And I think in the beginning stages, some people, they want to just like go all in on one idea, which is cool. That works for some people. Some people like to roll the dice on a bunch of different things. And in the very early stages, that's typically what I do. I give it like a few weeks for every idea to see like what the market is pulling for and like what can actually get momentum because they're naturally just with a landing page interested in signing up for it or maybe entering credit card and I refund them or whatever it is, just like market testing. And um, that was just something that really stood out to me. You can just re-roll a bunch of things and when you get to your 10th idea you could have something that really pops off and people really want that so exactly. that's what i try to do now after i read that book i'm like okay i guess it took him 15 years to get to the justin bieber moment but maybe with different business ideas that i'm bootstrapping i could just post about them online post some landing pages and just give it a couple days is anybody signing up no kill it okay do another one then do another one then do another one and until one like really gets a lot of momentum and people are really paying attention to it just keep trying because it's out there. You just have to find it. It's like digging for gold or something, and you just got to keep re-rolling. So I'm I so love that I'm so happy I asked that question. Yeah, sometimes sometimes as a podcast host, I feel like I meander too much in conversation, and people are always looking for like the real technical, like tell me how to make money advice. But I'm always really happy when I do, because that idea that like nobody actually knows anything so we're on podcast, and if you're listening to this, but if you're if you're watching the YouTube video, I'm gonna turn my camera real quick. I got this sign on my wall, right there. It says nobody knows anything, and I I I say it to myself pretty often because like sometimes I think I know what I'm doing, <laughs> right? And then like uh, and, and sometimes I think like oh okay, I got this figured out. I'm gonna do this, and it's totally gonna work. And then it just flops, and I have no idea why. And the same is true with the stock market. I mean, you know, look at, this isn't an economic show, but look at the um, American economy right now. Like everybody was so sure we were going into a recession. Like no one has a clue what they're doing. 100%. And so just approaching, approaching entrepreneurship with that mindset of, hey, I don't have to be smart. I just have to like test and observe and test and observe. I, I think is like, it's, it's not just practical. It's also very... Um, it's, it's a lot less emotionally daunting because there's not a lot of pressure. You just try stuff out and if it works, it works. And if it works, you don't have to take credit for it. And if it doesn't work, you don't have to take the blame for it. So hundred um, I'm glad we weren't there. I guess the only thing that I would kind of add is it gets kind of hard like in the beginning stages because you get kind of attached to an idea. And if you're branding it for and sure. building a website and putting a little effort into it, you get attached to it. It's like your baby, you know what I mean? So I think that for some people, and I mean, even for me, like I find it sometimes you want something to succeed because it's like your baby, but it's not really in your control totally because the market's either going to want it or they're not. And if they don't want it and you're pushing it down their throat, then your time is probably better off doing something else. Um, so yeah, I guess like getting out of that emotional state and just looking at data yeah. instead could be really powerful, but it's easier said than done. No question. No question. All right. Um, thank you for, for going down that side quest with me. Um, so let's get into it. Why Reddit? I mean, Reddit traditionally has been, how do I say it? There's like a real strong gatekeeper community around Reddit. It's very, very difficult to jump into a subreddit and just say, hey, everybody look at me. There's a real traditionalist mindset sort of built into the culture of Reddit. And for that reason, I've always stayed away from it. And I've I've, I've seen Reddit more as like, it's entertainment, but it's, you can find information on Reddit that you can't find anywhere else. It's it's like very, very unique in that way where there's just such an influx of creative 
people who see the world from a different lens. And I know that sounds kind of meta, but Reddit really does have that sort of like old school Apple culture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so with that at top of mind, of all the platforms that you could dive into, like why did you decide to dive into the one that is the hardest to quote unquote market yourself on? Um, I love that. Uh, so it wasn't really a choice. I was like already a Reddit user. I've been a Reddit user for years. Like just naturally I go on yeah. Reddit. No, I mean, now I go on ChatGPT a lot more, but if I would have a nuanced question that maybe Google wouldn't have the answer to or is maybe experiential, I would just go on Reddit. And prior to that, or at the same time, really, when I first started, I would go into Facebook groups. So like private Facebook groups, I would just join them and like just kind of interact with people, if that makes sense. And uh, yeah, I was just kind of like question and answer type stuff. I had a question, somebody would give me an answer. And then I built a website like a couple of years ago that uh, I was like, it was my first one that I was building. And it was like a product that I was selling. And I was like, can I get anybody to buy this thing? You know, and it was like a book that I put together uh, for like music. And basically I posted it in like a Facebook group and somebody bought it within like 30 minutes. And I was like, oh, this wow. can actually be really powerful. And so um, I didn't end up pursuing that, but I was like, okay, like these groups can be really powerful if you just know how to leverage them. So then I built a different business off the back of Facebook groups and I parlayed it also into Reddit because I was also a Reddit user and I was like, some of these communities are relatively large. If I could just kind of like mirror the same strategy that I'm doing on Facebook groups, maybe it'll work on Reddit too. And uh, it ended up working. I ended up going number one a bunch of times in some of these music subreddits. And I was cool. like, okay, this works. And so I built this kind of like music software business that had like 55,000 newsletter subscribers and it was selling like software products. And um, yeah, I was like, okay, this is cool. I got a profitable in like three months and I was able to build it off the back of Reddit and Facebook groups. Primarily like Facebook groups was like my first shot at it. <laughs> but I was like, Reddit's the same kind of thing. It's a forum. Uh, it's How like long a ago was this? Uh, this was in like 2018. 2019 oh, okay yeah, yeah yeah got it go ahead so yeah i was just like okay it works and i'm already a user it wasn't really a decision as far as like this is the hardest platform and i want to crack it it was more like yeah this is the platform that i know because i'm on it i don't understand i didn't understand twitter at the time youtube i was like i don't know what to make youtube videos it was like reddit and facebook were like the only ones that i was really using so yeah some people are like why'd you choose that but it was like it wasn't really it was just i was already using it you know I think, well, that's very unique to people with Reddit because there's like a, I don't know, I don't want to harp on this too much, but I think you have to actually spend time on Reddit to know what I'm talking about. Like people really get to know each other on Reddit and people can tell if you're an insider or an outsider, right? And they like shun outsiders. Exactly. Yeah. It's not something that they take lightly. And, um, and so I think you're probably right where you almost had to earn like your reputation inside these communities. So does that, the way that you approach using Reddit as marketing, do you spend the first, however many days, weeks, months, even like earning your reputation first? Is that kind of part of, of how you would approach it? Um, I guess it doesn't really have to do with a particular profile, if that's kind of what you're saying, like building rapport around a certain profile where people recognize the name and they knew who I, know who I am. Exactly. Because I don't exactly. know that, like, I don't know who specific Reddit profiles are. Like, I see them sometimes, like, pop up in certain subreddits, but I don't know who the people are behind them or what the profile is of that specific profile, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know how they typically interact. I just see their name pop up sometimes, and I don't really think about it much more than that. I think that it's just like the way you interact, you know, like the yeah. way you talk to people and you like they can interact just tell, with them. They sniff you out. It's a culture thing. Like you have to understand yeah. the culture and they can kind of sniff it out based off of if you're interacting in the way that the culture typically flows, if that makes sense. So if you're coming in and you're like, it's the first time and you don't understand the culture or how to interact with it, then they're going to sniff you out. They're going to know that you're just a shill or whatever it is. But if you've been in it for a while and you know how to kind of correspond with these people, what presents value to them and what they want to see, then it's like you're kind of Reddit native, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? It does make sense. It makes perfect sense for sure. So, okay. Uh, let me take a step back because there's a couple of things that I want to personally clarify. Mm -hmm. You have this 
brand around you through Reddit, right. not yeah. necessarily the brand inside Reddit. But when I think of you, I think, oh, okay, like the, the Reddit right. guy. But then you also have exploding ideas and exploding ideas is your newsletter, which, which isn't necessarily about Reddit. It seems like it's more upcoming topics, upcoming opportunities. And you use a lot of like a Google uh, search trends to analyze what you think is an exploding market or what could be a declining market. What, yeah. how does that look practically inside your business? Like is your, is your view on Reddit something that you are just using for your own <laughs> newsletter and you're documenting that process or is marketing inside of Reddit another business opportunity for you within itself, like autonomously from, from exploding ideas? So I guess first question, um, if this is something that I'm doing within the newsletter, yeah, this is how I've grown it to where it is today. I think I just hit like 8,000 subscribers. All of them have been from Reddit. And, uh, so basically cool. the idea is like, there's so many people running paid ads, whether it's Twitter ads, whatever, Facebook ads, meta, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, I just think that they're just overlooking a great opportunity, which is organic growth. And I think that if you can figure out organic growth in the beginning, then you will be able to have tailwinds in your product and it'll be way easier for you to get, uh, basically product market fit and profitability. So if you can basically promote it on Reddit or you can promote it on Twitter and you can get a lot of signups for what you're doing, um, then you have people that just naturally want what you have. Because when you use like Twitter ads or Facebook ads, whatever it is, it's designed to work. So, I mean, yeah. if you just pay however much money, you're going to get people signing up for it. So, I mean, whether it's a dollar uh, per user sign up or like $10 per user sign up, they're going to shove it down people's throats and they're going to get somebody to sign up for it. You know what I mean? Whether in the US or somewhere else in the world, who knows, but they're going to find that person. And, um, I think that if you can kind of solve it from scratch and get it organically going, that it's a different level of just like product market fit in a way. So my idea with exploding ideas is I want to show people that like organic growth is something that you can do. You don't have to be spending all these money on ads. You will get like a dopamine hit, I guess, and the it's a gratification if you do ads because like it doesn't really take much effort. I mean, in a sense, and uh, you can grow really quickly and all you have to do is kind of pour more money into it. But if you can figure out the organic growth side, you can grow something from nothing, really. And that's kind of how I did my first few businesses. They were just like, I did it with like not that much money, but I figured out the organic growth side and I was able to get to profitability and build like side income for myself. And I think you could do the same thing with a newsletter or any website, really. But the organic growth side, cracking that code, once you've cracked it, then I feel like it kind of opens you up to a lot of opportunities, but you have to crack it. And that's really hard for people. And, um, I just want to show people that it is possible. So it's something that I've been doing in the newsletter, leading by example in a way, and just kind of, yeah. this is kind of the ethos of exploding ideas, just like organic growth. Um, so that's the first question. Uh, the yeah. second one was, is this another business that could kind of live exclusively to, or outside of, I mean, uh, exploding ideas? I guess it depends if you're talking about like an agency type business. Is that kind of where you're going with it? I'm not going anywhere with it. I'm, I'm just simply inquiring about do you see this reddit growth strategy as something that you're singularly using for yourself or do you see this as like a separate opportunity in whatever way that might look like are you going to create products around it are you going to create a service business around it is it something that that like you have other kind of side hustles that you haven't really talked about that you're using the same strategy or basically is reddit a part of exploding ideas or do you see reddit as something autonomous so I definitely see it as part of exploding ideas. And I've been trying to figure out because so many people have been hitting me up on Twitter, like, Hey, can you do this for me? Or yeah. can you show me how to do this? Or they just want more. Or can you, cause I uh, wrote about on Twitter that I had a, uh, I trained a VA to do it. So like, I'm not doing it anymore. I have a VA doing it on my behalf and he's pretty effective with it. And I taught him how to do it. I had him like go through some tests and like, I just basically wrote a book for him and I just like really trained him if that makes sense. So people are like, hey, you understand this stuff. Can you help me do it? Whether it's through a course or whether through it's uh, an agency where I do it on their behalf or just some other way. So I've definitely been thinking about it. I'm just like, what's the best medium for it? So I tested like an agency model uh, in July and I hated it. It was like really, really labor intensive and it was taking a lot of my like headspace 
and I don't think the money was like enough to really be like something worth putting that much headspace into in that uh, the people that I was doing it for were so used to paid ads. So I was getting paid for like uh, three, four dollars per subscriber. And organic growth is very different in that like it's more speculative. You can make a post on Reddit that doesn't go anywhere and it gets like down votes and it gets zero people to sign up for your newsletter or your product or whatever it is. Or you could have one that is pretty similar, but it just resonates so well because of the day or the time or what the market sentiment, whatever it is, it could resonate in a completely different way. And you'll get like 150, 500, whatever signups to your newsletter or website. So it's like very speculative. And I found that I was using my time very speculatively. I was leaning yeah. into the VA, so I was working with him, but I really wanted to go above and beyond for these people. And I felt oh, like oh. it was just too much stress. Like, cause you don't hit your, you don't hit like the same amount every single day of signups. One day it could be zero. Another day it could be 200. It's like you're speculating, you know what I mean? So that for me was just like really hard on me. And I was just like, you know, like, is this something that I want to be putting my time into? Could I be maybe doing this as a course and just teaching people that want to pay for it, how to do it, or just do one that's structured for VAs. So that's kind of where I've been going with it. I'm building this VA Reddit course that I'm basically going to teach your VA how to do it. Granted, they can like think strategically and they're like smart. Um, they can take this course, they can apply it, and they can just basically do it and they'll do it for you. And I got 8,000 subscribers through doing this. And if you were to do it through ads, you would be paying thousands of thousands of dollars, but I'll just show you how to do it and you can get organic growth via your VA through this course. So that's kind of the route I'm going with it because the uh, agency model, that was really just giving me a headache. And I was like, I feel like my time isn't maybe best spent doing this because I was having to oversee the VA every day. Like, hey, we need to get more subscribers today. Like, it's just like, I just, I, I didn't want to do that anymore. I was like, by the end of the oh, month, pressure. I was over it. And I was like, I feel like this is a sign that maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing because just mentally I couldn't handle it. I think that's very honest of you. Um, agencies are tough. I, I, uh, what's the word for it? I promote freelance and agency work for people when they're starting off because it's a, a perfect model because there's no upstart costs mm -hmm. and they're instantly profitable. And the trick to agencies is figuring out how to get out of the way, but it's, it's super difficult because as the leader, you're usually the one that ends up closing the deals. Mm -hmm. And then that means that the person that you close the deal with sees you as like on the other end of the hook. So anytime they have a problem, they call you, right? And like, it's difficult to figure out how to get out of that. And it takes a long time. So it's not for everybody. And I think that's like really honest and, and smart that you can recognize that before you get buried under, under a Reddit pile. You strike me as a guy who still sees opportunities everywhere. I mean, geez, when you were telling your, your, your story about how you got here, part of your job was just to come up with an, with the idea, with ideas and then pitch them to the executive. I thought, um, you know, that was like very mm -hmm. foreshadowing of where you ended up now, because that's basically what you're doing. You're finding mm -hmm. ideas and you're presenting them to the public. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I mean, how, how much of what you're building now is bringing your mind into other places saying like, oh, I could do something here. I could do something here. Or do you have that rare and super innate ability to actually just fully focus on the one thing that you're doing? So. I mean, it definitely happens. Like if you, I mean, yeah. I'm literally researching every day and looking for opportunities. Uh, granted, I was also doing this before Exploding Ideas, just looking for opportunities constantly, just because I feel like the internet's kind of like a video game. And if you can figure out like yeah. a business that works and it's online, it's just like, it's all just like video game numbers because like the money will hit your bank account or whatever. And I wouldn't necessarily touch it because I save a lot of it. But anyways, it just, it all feels like a video game. And so, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think like... Uh, Sorry, what was the question again? I, I started uh, going off on a tangent, but um, what was the question again? Sorry. Oh, I was, I was just kind of wondering what else you have going on mm -hmm. because you, you seem like a guy that you, you see opportunities all day. It's basically your job. And 
do you have the ability to like ignore that and mm -hmm. just focus fully on your newsletter? Or yeah. when you see these opportunities, do you, do you find ways to take advantage of them? It depends. Um, so like from when I worked in venture capital, one thing that I really learned there was you need an edge. And that yeah. was always the thing when I was working there when we would, so we had a fund of funds model also where uh, we would invest in other funds uh, because our fund size was relatively large. So basically we would always ask them like, what is your edge? What makes you different? Like, why are you going to win in the market? And uh, so for one company, it might be like they're the A16Z of like South Korea or something. Like it was like that, like, because most, I mean, in venture capital for people that don't know, most of the deals flow to like the biggest funds and then they kind of like cascade down to the lesser known ones that people don't really, aren't as interested in. They all flow to like Andreessen Horowitz and like benchmark and companies like that. And then they all flow down. So um, that was like kind of the mentality, like what is your edge? You need to define your edge, why you're going to win in that market. And uh, you just need to kind of like lean into it and harness that. So that's always my perspective with finding ideas. So I'm always researching and finding ideas, but whether I pursue them or not, usually I don't because I don't have an edge. Like if I was to go into solar, I mean, I don't have an edge. You know what I mean? Uh, I have no background yeah. in that unless there's like an amazing like opportunity for me that I know that I could harness, then I'm not going to do it just because like I'm going to get crushed by all these other people. So I'll put out the ideas in the newsletter. That kind of gives me that outlet, all the research and stuff. I'll put it all out in the newsletter. So somebody else that has that domain expertise or they have that background or they have that edge, they can take it and they can run with it. And maybe it'll fuel them to make their own business. So that was kind of the idea behind it. So yeah, I'm always finding ideas, but I don't necessarily pursue them if I have no edge. So I have three things that I'm doing right now. Um, one of them is relatively passive and I've owned it for five years. It's in the music space. Um, another one is in the real estate space and then there's exploding ideas. Um, and I've had some others throughout the years that I've built the, uh, music software one I sold. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm always looking for ideas. I don't necessarily always pursue them. I need like, this is obvious that I could win in this space for me to actually pursue it. And then I'll test the market, see if it's something that people actually want. And I'll take it like one step at a time, you know, in trial and error. I'm sure like a lot of people do. Um, yeah. I, I love the idea of what is your edge? That's a very good lens to see something through because what's uh, this is a, a venture capital, excuse me, a venture capital phrase. And I can't remember exactly what it is, but basically as soon as as a market becomes viable, it's like already too late, right? Because everybody else has jumped in it. So the mm -hmm. only way that people actually win is if they're earlier and a little bit more um, like delusional almost. Like you're, you're delusional to an idea that shouldn't work, but you have to make it work anyway because mm -hmm. or else there's, there's no upside on it. And so seeing an opportunity through that lens, I think is really, really smart. I wish I would have heard that sooner because I've definitely pursued things in my life that, that thought that it was a bad yeah. idea. There was just nothing about me that made my idea particularly unique and different. And so that's cool. I, I really like that. Um, so let's, let's finish this thing up talking specifically about the newsletter. Um, I love it. Thank so you. So cool. Appreciate yeah. That. Like such a great idea. I, I really love I know that this is very subtle, but in the featured images, I think it's such a cool idea to use the Google Trends chart as the featured image, because I don't know if there's something about human beings that see charts. Maybe it's like a, tacti a tactical thing in, our, in our, our minds. It's got something to do with evolution somewhere, because anytime you put a chart in front of people, I noticed this on Bloomberg as well. Like I read a lot of Bloomberg and I'll be reading it. And then if there's a chart, I just always stop. And I'm like, what the hell is it about this chart that makes me, that has that pattern yeah. interrupt? So, so that's kind of subtle. I know that yeah. your newsletter yeah. isn't about yeah. Google charts, but I just love how your featured images are about the, the trend, whether it's an emerging trend or, or a declining trend. Uh, I'm going to start with like a, a very broad and almost like an unfair question here. Out of all the things that you discovered, which one is your favorite so far? Out of all the ideas? Yeah. Um, so far, I mean, got to be the one, uh, the green noise one, 
which was one of the first articles that I wrote. I think it was like number like four or five or something like that. That's my favorite one, mainly because I ended up at the end of the newsletter. I did it. So I was like, hey, guys, I'm going to show you how to do this. And I think it was like the startup costs to do it were like $20. And I checked my account the other day and my royalty account has like $750 in it. So oh, uh, yeah, it's made an insane profit. And so for that reason, I like that one. And it makes money every month now. And uh, so, yeah, I really like that one for that reason specifically, which is easy. It was just identifying a gap in the market that you could take advantage of really. Don't remember ever reading that. What is green noise? So green noise is like a sleep sound. And it's a sleep sound that took off on TikTok. So are you familiar with like white noise? Yeah, of course. Okay. So a lot of people... Like fuzz. Exactly. So for people that aren't aware, white noise is something that for people that have new babies, uh, they'll play white noise for the babies to sleep at night. That's why I'm aware of it. Okay. <laughs> um, did you just have a baby? Uh, well, my son is two and a half, so he still has the sound machine. And then we had a daughter... 10 months ago congrats so like there's just there's fucking sound machines like all over in my upstairs like it's like two different worlds that i live in there's the downstairs which is like the normal life and then there's the upstairs which is just (laughs) so that's my life right now that's so funny (laughs) well congratulations um thank you so yes basically white noise uh is a sound that people play for their babies it helps them sleep but some people also listen to it for themselves There's other sounds also like rain, waves that people use. Uh, Green noise is kind of like a derivative of white noise. It's a similar sound. It just highlights a different frequency range. And uh, it got really popular on TikTok. And if you look at the Google Trends or the uh, Google, yeah, Google Trends, uh, the chart, basically you can see just like a run up. And I took a screenshot of it when it was having that run up. And I was like, hey, like this seems really interesting. People are probably Googling it. And I'll just build a website around it. And I'll put it out on Spotify, Apple Music, those platforms, and just see what happens. You know, the upstart costs, I think, were like $20, $25, something like that. So it was like anybody could really do this. And I'll just see what happens. I'm taking a bet, you know, but it's calculated risk. There could be asymmetric upside to it. So, like, I could lose $25 or I can make infinitely more. Who knows? We'll see what happens. So build a website and uh, just included links to the Spotify and Apple Music and the iTunes. The website is still up? Yeah. Uh, I think it's called... What's Green- the website? I think it's called greennoisesleep.com. I don't check it very often, but it is up. Is it populating? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, yeah, I put up the website. The website didn't really drive much traffic, but I got natural momentum on the streaming services because people were searching for it. Basically, people were going from TikTok and then they were Googling it, and then they were going to Spotify, Apple Music, or Amazon Unlimited, and they were basically searching for these sounds. And there wasn't much in the market at the time, so I was just kind of early, and I hit this trend, and uh, people have been just streaming it while they sleep, I guess, or maybe like while they're studying. I don't know what the use case is completely, but yeah, I mean, yeah. it made money in the first month. I think it made like $300, and I'd put like $20, $25 into it, and now it's gotten up to $750, and I'm like, I'll take it. Thanks. 750 a month? Um, no, I think it's 750 in the in aggregate. Total? Yeah. Cool. But, but how I long ago did you put to, it up? Um, I put it up, I think, like three months ago or something like that. But I haven't no had to do way. anything. I literally just put it up and that's it. I didn't do anything else. And uh, there you go. Yeah. And so that's the type of idea that I like. That is so cool. Um, I, I uh, agree. Yeah. I, I don't agree. have something that cool. Mine yeah. is far less, like, sexy. But uh, the yeah. LSAT is a test that lawyers have to take is like one of the hardest tests. And so I discovered this whole market of test prep courses. So it's basically tests that you take in order to prepare to take the test. Yep. And, um, <laughs> and we put a website up and I wrote a couple of blog posts and uh, I got crushed by a Google algorithm, which sucks, man, because it was like 750 bucks a month I was getting yeah. up to. And okay. then I don't know if you've ever played with google before like i love seo i still think it is it is the winner but one of the downsides to it is one day sometimes for no reason at all google will just decide that they don't like you anymore and so right as i was starting to feel good about it i got completely crushed i mean like went to zero do you know why that happened like did you ever find out why they crushed you like what the reason was 
yeah it was um uh what was the up it was called the um, better content upgrade um uh, something something content but even still it's it's hard to totally know because basically what they wanted to do is make it so that experts were writing helpful content update that's what it was called oh. so that like the content, content that was written was actually credentialed by an expert, expert in the space and so you know i went back to the whole website and i reached out to all of these people and i reached out to the companies that were actually selling the courses that like we were selling on the website and had them go through all the content and asked if i could use their author bios in it to say like yes this content has been verified by a credentialed expert in the space and it and it just didn't work yeah. um but the, the whole reason why I, I even say that story is because i, I find a lot of times like sometimes i can feel like um not inauthentic just like i'm i'm bragging a little bit and i don't ever want it to be that way like i'm, I'm very fortunate that i've i've had success with the, the companies that i've created but uh but people will come to me sometimes and they just have this like intimidation Jeez. like this is never going to work for me like i don't think what you're saying is real life this doesn't right. actually work right. i tried to put up a website here i tried okay. to put up a website there yeah. and um it's just it's not, not true it's like a real mental block i think and right. i know it because i had that like there yeah. was a time in my life where i thought this is all bullshit none of this stuff actually works i'm just gonna like be in philly and build houses my whole life and uh and so <clears throat> i'm not really asking a question as much as I'm, I'm making an observation where sometimes when you see things and you try enough stuff, you'll discover that, yes, this does work and there's opportunities everywhere. Like when I say everywhere, everywhere, the more time you spend researching, you see like, holy shit, there's so much stuff to do right now. And it just takes that one little victory to like mentally convince yourself they're like oh okay this isn't make believe this is real and and i can do this so so like i said that's not so much a question but i'd love your feedback on that statement um so i think that i never get over that like um yeah. like the thing of like can i do this this is all like kind of like bs like it doesn't i don't know if i'm allowed to curse on here but um totally say whatever okay. you want yeah this is all like bullshit like you did it because maybe you had something that you're not sharing or something like that and you're mm -hmm. that's the reason why you're successful and i'm not that whole kind of like mentality um i think that i still struggle with it like i've had some things that have been successful but i'm like can i do it again or was that a fluke you know what i mean i think that it's like of course this, like kind of imposter syndrome thing that you never maybe get over and it'll exist some way in your life and i think that you just kind of need to like be optimistic and just kind of have hope for a better future if that makes sense and just kind of trial and error and just look at data and just be like, is this working? Is it not? If it's not working, don't take offense to it. You know, don't be emotional about it. Just move on and just try to go to the next thing. And maybe that'll work. Maybe it won't. But I think that framing it as all like a game that you have to figure out, like you're trying to crack the code and like beat this game. That could be like a helpful way to look at it as opposed to like, I need to make money. I need to make this work. And maybe I'm an entrepreneur. Maybe I'm not. And it's kind of riding on this one thing working. Most entrepreneurs, they have like multiple things that they've started before they've become successful. I think like it's like two or three businesses before they've become successful. So it's yeah. like, I mean, you look at like Elon Musk or Jack Dorsey or whatever, these major people, but it's like, don't look at them. Like just focus on doing your own thing. The average I think is like two or three businesses to become successful and just like ignore everything online because everybody online or a lot of people, they're flexing their success and it's not necessarily the truth behind the scenes, if that makes sense. Like they're putting things out that are going to get engagement and that are going to present them in like a specific light that they want you to see them in. But it's not necessarily like all of the ups and downs that they're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis, because like some days you'll have days where you have a big issue, like what you were describing in your business, where you're making seven fifty a month and then you kind of got slapped by the Google and al the, the algorithm. That happens in like every kind of business, whether it's Google or another company that's kind of like- Or something, or whatever. Or you lose a big customer or whatever it yeah. is, or you get a bunch of refunds in a specific day. And those are down days, but that's just the nature of like entrepreneurial life. You have ups and downs, you have high highs, you have low lows. Um, you just got to kind of be like agnostic to it, if that makes sense. So like, just try to like be even keel and like sit in the middle. And uh, if you have a great high, high day, try to ignore it. And then if you have a low, low day, try to ignore that too. You know, just kind of like sit in the middle, 
look at the data and try to be as unemotional as possible. So I guess that would be my take on it. I don't know if that's like helpful, sure. but that's how I try to look at it. So helpful. So helpful. I, I've been doing this for a long time yeah. and yeah. it's tough to talk about this stuff because like you said, nobody wants to listen to somebody that fails all the time. Yeah. But I don't think people understand for every one success I have, I have at least like 30 failures. And 100%. failures are like, they're like micro failures. You know, it's like shit that didn't work, shit that didn't work. And like most nights I go to bed thinking like nothing works. I don't actually know what I'm doing. But then as I've gotten older, I've come to the conclusion that that actually is the thing that is the skill. It's it's tinkering. It's iterating. Mm -hmm. It's coming to terms with the fact that like it's okay to not know. It's just not okay to not keep learning a hundred percent it's you know it's i'm not like a life coach here and so i'm I'm stuttering a little bit forgive me to everybody listening as i as i stumble over this but the thing that i have found that works for me is constant little fall forwards there's constantly like my whole life i'm so anxious all the time because i'm just tripping over shit all the time <laughs> you know just stumbling we, forward and then we all are here we are you know and and, and it's working out I, I don't know how else to put it other than that I mean, I think you're exactly right. And back to the thing where you were talking about like consistent learning, I think that's amazing that you read so many books and you're so dedicated to doing that and your parents instilled that in you. Um, my parents Thanks. didn't really, like I kind of had to like find it on my own actually through Ty Lopez's ads on YouTube, like talking about oh. like knowledge. And I was like, okay, this is actually kind of practical. I'm going to buy some books. And I ended up buying books and reading them. Knowledge. And, yeah. I mean, it was like, and I did not <laughs> like him, but I liked the message that he was kind of portraying. And um yeah, I was like, this seems practical. I hated reading from college. It made me hate reading books. But anyways, I got into it and I was like, okay, this is actually really fun. If you find a topic that you're interested in, you learn about it and you just kind of dedicate yourself to like getting better and learning every day. And that's the same thing with the businesses. Like you have all these failures or everybody does. Like I have a lot of failures as well. Um, but it's like you learn something from everyone. And sometimes you make mistakes that prior to going into it, you're like, I know I'm kind of like, making a mistake going into this. I'm ignoring this specific thing that typically I wouldn't do. And then you maybe get screwed. And then you're like, okay, well, I should never ignore that. I should always look at that. And just like, even if it looks promising in the future, just like stick with my gut yeah. and my kind of like learnings that I've had in the past. But you have to just be like dedicated to this learning and trial and error. And whether it's coming from books and other people's experiences or your own experience, I think that dedication to learning is so important. So yeah, to your point, I think that's really important. Cool. What a great way to end the conversation. I, I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you, Eric. I did too. I, I really appreciate your time. Yeah, Thank you for was... having me. No, my pleasure. Th thanks for coming on. Um, okay, so let's do the um, the podcast outro, right? We got explodingideas.co, not .com, .co. I highly recommend subscribing to it. Um, I, I, I very much enjoyed it. Like I said, I think you're really on to, on to something here. Thank and you. Then, um eric lamb ideas on twitter uh and anything else that you want people to know about you before we wrap up um i don't think so um it was <laughs> great speaking with you and uh yeah if Likewise. you guys want to follow me on twitter uh, i'd love to have you if you'd like to subscribe to the newsletter would love to have you there as well and i hope you guys get value from it that's my main thing i just want people to get value from the newsletter and twitter and you get unique value from both channels that's really kind of like what I'm trying to bring to the table as well. Every channel that I have, I want to be unique from the other channels. So you want to kind of like follow it all to get all of the value, if that makes sense. So yeah, uh, cool. it was great to be here and thank you for having me. Of course. Thank you everybody for listening. If you enjoy the show, leave us a rating on iTunes or Spotify. It's the best thing you can do to support the show. All of the links to the newsletter, to the Twitter, and all the things that we talked about are going to be in the show notes at copybloggerpod.com. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk to you next week.